This is just to prove Bob wrong that, you know, being a little bit younger than him, I'm not going to use PowerPoint or any technology. So, that there are kinks in every distribution, um, as he talked about. Look, I'd just like to say a few words. I, I realise we're running late. On, on the first um, couple of presentations, the first, I, having worked in ECHA in my, all of the 90s and the early 2000s and then switched to East Asia, I, it was... I felt like, you know, it, it was all these reminiscences coming back, listening to the Polish and then the Chinese experience. It's really nights of drinking vodka versus nights of drinking baijiu. I can divide my life into those two periods, I think. But uh, what, one thing was very striking, I think, uh, from the Eka experience, and it's not just Poland or Central Europe, it, it applies throughout the so former Soviet Union, the Balkans and other parts. There are so many lessons there for our countries who are now trying to expand coverage. Um, and I think a lot of the time in the pension dialogue here, we focus either on the existing system and its parametric reforms or on coverage expansion. They tend to be... Awesome. I can't even use the one piece of technology correctly. Um, or one or the other. And, and I think one of the things I take away from the ECHA lessons in this and then some of John's stuff is that you can't have those discussions independently of one another. So John's points on the urban withdrawal from labour force in, in you know, our countries in Eastern Asia that have pension systems, formal pension systems, often with low coverage, 20, 30 per cent, um, is very striking. And, and it's for very similar reasons that, that the ECHA countries had. Um, you know, early retirement ages, earlier in fact than ECHAs are now, Early, uh, sorry, no, early official retirement ages, which are earlier than ECHA's. Um, most of ECHA has moved to 65 or beyond or is moving there in some shape or form. Most of East Asia is still stuck at 60 or thereabouts and, you know, the higher end is trying to move in different ways, but there's been far too little movement, certainly in the middle income group, on, on that kind of thing. Early retirement provisions are even more severely out of whack in a number of our countries than they were in ECHA. So in Vietnam, for example, the decrement for a year of early retirement is 1%. It should be about 5 or 6%. So really dramatic parametric problems in, in some of these systems. Vietnam's probably an extreme case. Um, at the same time, we're having the coverage expansion discussion. They tend to separate into a kind of social pension and a contributory pension discussion. But I think the, the ECHA experience is one that as you formalise more, as you urbanise more, combining the lessons of those two, I, I, I think, is, is really important. Um, and I, I would take away from that. Um, the other thing that I think was very striking about John's presentation, again, relates to the experience of ECHA, was, was the male and female divides, the joint retirement decision that John was talking about and showing in the data. And it, it kind of makes sense, you know, assuming we have some vague regard for our spouse at the time of their retirement or our retirement, we probably want to, or hopefully, want to spend more time together. Uh, but again, East Asian pension systems still, in a number of countries, have this five or even in urban China, ten-year gap if you're a blue-collar woman and a, and a, and a man. Um, so that, I, again, I took away from the ECHA experience. ECHA started with that kind of five-year gap, typically, but has increasingly tried to bring them together. Countries in East Asia have done the same thing. Uh, Korea and other countries, I think, already have same male and female retirement age or are, are moving there. Uh, but certainly in the middle income, it's still a significant issue that, that needs to be dealt with. And for which there's very little sympathy amongst policymakers. You get long stories of how the women of Vietnam or the women of China have suffered and the you know, you wonder, have, did the men ever? But uh, it, it's, it's, you know, it may well be true, but it, it's difficult to deal with. The second thing I took away from John's one was, if there is, and we already observe, more urbanisation, gradually more formalisation, um, is there a risk that, unlike Thomas's ones, where we're talking about positive <laughs> increases in labour force participation, we, we, we're in for a negative shock? Uh, as rural people become urban and maybe get into pensions. Um, I think it's certainly a concern if they went straight into the formal, unreformed system. That seems, in the way countries are approaching it in this region, to be slightly less likely to happen because of reliance on social pensions or hybrid models like, like China's. Um, but nonetheless, it, it speaks to the importance of set levels of pensions for this coverage expansion. I think the, the China one is encouraging. That, that pension is really very low, 9 or $10 a month. 
but it speaks to the importance of not assuming your original parameters from the original system as, as you go for expansion. The final thing I'd say which links to the training side of things, and I, I'd be interested in kind of discussions with people, um, it's in the policy makers we interact with in the region, we are the developing Asia, there's a very strong lump of labour fallacy um, uh, perception still. So when we talk about raising retirement age, the very first thing that comes in is, oh, all these cultural revolution workers, they're useless anyway. If we keep them in the labour force, we deny young people jobs. And you hear that argument, I've heard it, certainly in, in developing country after developing country in Asia. Um, now, economists, I think we're, we're on the flip side too simplistic and just wave the lump of labour fallacy at them and say, you know, read the book or, or whatever. Um, I think some of Bob's stuff really begins to nuance. Uh, well, firstly, it, it, it makes it more pronounced at one level, but I think it brings in a whole degree of nuance that we probably need to talk about when we're talking about pensions, skills, and, and, and those kind of things. Um, on the skills side of things, I, I think Bob's thing is, is, is very striking. I'm sure as he develops it will, will be even more so. As he said, for this region, it's not just computerization, it's you know, shift from state to market, all kinds of structural change that, that you know, are, are perhaps even bigger than computerization in certain senses. Um, again, I think when we talked in ECHA in the 90s or early 2000s, it tended to divide to an ideological discussion between those who favoured active labour programs and those who didn't. And, there wasn't a lot of, uh, you know, it was easy to find evidence for unproductive active labour programs, but it was always done in big averages. And we talked about, you know, all groups, all active labour programs. And I think uh, Bob's point, you know, is very clear that both within the market and within interventions in the market, one has to you know, disaggregate this a lot more than, than we've done in those um, discussions in the past. Um, Certainly, the, I mean, such evidence as we had, as, as was mentioned in Poland, is not hugely encouraging for those over 45. But I think one of the things we'll need to do in this kind of work and literature is also link up what are the objectives of this training, retooling, whatever, however one characterises it. There's, we, as economists, we always look at the output, you know, the kind of production function of training, how much more output we get from a worker after how much training. I think with all the literature on cognition, delayed cognitive decline and that kind of thing from social, the social engagement aspect of work, the social inclusion and other aspects of work, well, it will be interesting over time to link up those literatures and get better kind of whole of economy measures of you know, some, of the, some of the positive things of people staying in work longer, even if the direct productive effect at time when you retrain them over certain ages is not so great. Um, the other thing I would say is in this region already we have a lot of experimentation happening and certainly Japan and Korea and I, I'm not as familiar Angelique with Singapore but I, I think Singapore as well I would put in that category have tried to work on this a hell of a lot and they've been innovating furiously perhaps almost too furiously at times. Um, but they've done it in several ways. One is to intervene on the price side. So in, in Japan you know, and Korea they've tried structurally to bend the wage curve, if you like. So in Korea, you have the peak wage system. They're trying to spread that, you know, beyond 55 or so, there's a mechanism for adjusting wages downwards. Japan, similarly, beyond 60 with their, their recent reforms, um, you know, is doing that. And you observe wages of a Japanese person at, after official retirement. Singapore, I know, is experimenting with various ways of setting performance-related pay that breaks it up into various components that one can deal with. So there's the price side interventions. Um, the second is that all of them have multiple skill and training subsidies that they've been trying. Um, the big thing there is they're very, not very well evaluated, I think is probably the case. Career is an interesting case, I think, where there, there was evaluation of some of the wage or training subsidies and, and they were found to be kind of a lot of dead weight losses and they've been trying to adjust and refine the program. Uh, but again, I think the lesson from that is it's not necessarily training or wage subsidies or whatever the intervention is for all workers over a certain age, that targeting in some shape or form, um, not necessarily by income level, but by, by different characteristics is, is probably valuable. Um, and then the workplace adjustments, I, th I think, was mentioned, and I think the, the European are, you know, and, and the Asian companies are ahead on that. Thank you. Thank you.
So, any questions? Uh, some, some of you raise your hand. Oh, sorry. Good. Going back to you. So, my question would be like it's basically a relative example. So, the question is open to anyone who wants to answer. <laughs> so, uh, would you like? We have discussed a lot of factors which influence retirement decisions, like real uh, retirement decisions, not the government uh, recommended age for retirement. So. We see like uh, in some of the surveys I've read, like countries who are actually growing a lot faster than the others. For example, if Japan is growing at a relatively slower rate, people tend to uh, extend their retirement age and they tend to work a lot longer compared to China, who's been growing really fast. And there have been surveys which have to, like uh, results have come out that people want to retire at the age of uh, 55, 58. So if we want to relate this to even organizations who are been really performing well, they are not really focused on getting people retired by the like age of 52, 53, giving them all the voluntary options to retirement. So, would we can can we really relate the economic performance of a uh, country or an organization to sentiments which drive decisions towards retirement? Any volunteer? think of the supply and the demand side. So, the, so there's one, one thing, if you've got sort of this rapid growth and, and if that's been accompanied by rapid technical change and rapid organizational changes and, and, and the like, um, there may be an advantage to, to relatively younger workers compared to older workers. And so firms might say, well, there, I mean, we heard one, one comment, I think, about sort of firms wanting to get <laughs> Get rid, get rid of their their, their older workers, um, and of course that uh, in in societies in which in which uh, fertility has fallen and, and the supply of younger workers are getting scarcer, there would be a, at the other side sort of an incentive for the firms to start figuring out well how are we going to make use of of the older workers. Uh, because because it's hard to get younger workers. Uh, that's not yet been the case, and we still have this uh, demographic uh, 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 window where where the growth of working age uh, people is, is is still high. But eventually, that'll change. I think there's another thing in in a number of the countries that have had rapid growth have also had rapid growth of education, and. Uh, one of the striking things that you have with rapid growth of education is how different the educational levels of, of parents and children are, of older and younger people, and, and it seems that, seems that there would be interesting scope for thinking about what are the gains from trade of, 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 uh, of, combining, uh, of, of combining people with different, different ages. Uh, and within families, uh, uh, oftentimes the kids can do quite a bit of service for the parents right. who may not understand modern health care practices <laughs> or may not understand other kinds of things. And there, may be, there may be scope for that, for that as well. Okay. When we actually look within regions in China, so the low women's labor force participation outcome is actually more pronounced in the slower growth regions of China than in the sort of rapid growth coastal areas where you know, wages are higher. So this would, would you know, some, some of this work is service sector and, and perhaps self-employment, but when the return to work is higher, people will stay in the labor force longer. It's a completely different, has perhaps nothing to do with skill, but just that even the demand for unskilled work is higher. So it's not, <clears throat> Probably a bit, a bit of sentiment also, and a bit of sentiment in terms of uh, people being very optimistic in a high growth scenario, sure. and people being very pessimistic that they really don't know what's going to happen after 10 years <coughs> if they retire early. 
it's also in China the cost, the direct cost. I mean, the from well, not only province to province, but at the sub-provincial level, the actual contribution rate for pensions varies mm -hmm. quite substantially. Mm -hmm. um, so in Guangdong, for example, it's in the teens in many cities. In other areas, it's around 30%. So the direct cost, and it tends to be the more dynamic areas that have the somewhat lower contribution rates. So yeah, the, 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 even the direct cost of, uh, of the older worker is, is low. Okay, why don't we uh, break for coffee now? Okay, thank you.